RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello Cave Dwellers and welcome to another Retro Road Trip. Today we're at what I think is the most impressive private collection of micros that we've seen on the uh, channel to date and it belongs to this man, Mike. Mike, you, thank you for having us. Hello Neil. Hello Mike. We're welcome the, uh, to the Micro Museum. The Micro Museum here in Ramsgate in Kent. Mike, you've been collecting for the best part of four decades now, haven't you? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> just, just the four, four decades. decades that's all. Uh, where and how did it start for you? Well, it actually started, uh, I bought a ZX81 mm -hmm. in the early 80s. It was the only thing that we could afford at the time. And then uh, my wife wanted to do word processing, so we bought a BBC Micro. Uh, a friend of mine also had a BBC Micro, and uh, it was, I think it was probably the most expensive home computer at the time. And he turned around to me and he said, Mike, he said, you've got enough technology in the BBC to last you 20 years. <laughs> so what happens, I bought the BBC, 18 months later, the Archimedes came out. So uh, I used to uh, go to work in the Museum of London mm -hmm. and um, on the way to work, I used to go around a few car boot sales and um, one of the things I found was a Dragon 32 and it had the own um, computer course and it was beautifully illustrated and it was all bound in I think it was five or six volume and I had it in my head at the time that the computers that was being um, produced the older ones were being superseded very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I decided to look around for all the old Sinclair computers. In the Museum of London there was um, a display case and it was all about tin toys, tin plate toys, and it was by a chap called Ernest King. And uh, I, whenever I used to work in the galleries, I always used to go and have a look in the case and it always seemed to, to change. And uh, I used to find things I never saw before, mm -hmm. and it was fun working in the museum. So uh, uh, at a later date, uh, I can't remember what year it was now, they had an exhibition called the Carry On Collecting Exhibition, which they allowed me to have a case um, which had the a lot of my computers which I'd collected at the time. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that was one of my proudest moments in the, the Museum of London. And I thought, well, this is great because I, I liked pe people enjoying themselves. I'm not really much of a gamer myself, but I like to see people enjoying themselves. And that was one of the things that we tried to do by opening up the museum. We did have all the machines in here, but we tried to uh, make it larger so that there was one spot mainly for the computers and the other spot was for people to play on the games so mm -hmm. when people come to the museum now they can have a look around the museum we give them a little ticket they can go down the road and they can play on the games there's yeah. about 30 to 40 different positions mm -hmm. where they can play games yeah so just down the road there's another building which is dedicated completely to games playing it's a fantastic room when you had this display then, is this when the seed started for you to start your own museum or had you always had ambitions to open your own museum? Well, it? it was only after I collected quite a few items that I decided that I would like to do it. Um, but I never had the opportunity to do it because we were caring for my wife's parents and my uh, parents. So um, I just couldn't do it. I was working quite a lot. and. Um, 
So it had to be put on the back burner. My collection is what I call organised chaos. And I usually, uh, when I get something out, it doesn't always go back, unfortunately, where it should do. But, um, well, it's fun. Yeah, well, I think it'd be a good idea if we take a look at some of these things, because there's so much to see, not least what looks like the shop window from heaven behind me. There's a huge amount of stuff on display here. So we're going to take a close look at that and all of the other items around uh, the museum. Right. Should we start, Mike, with your very first computer, which I know is down at the other end? We'll go and have a look at that and okay. we'll work our way off from there, shall we? we Let's will, have a look. Yeah. Is this all the 80s, but progressing it's through the 80s? It's more or less so early 80s and 90s. It's a later, It's yeah. a little bit out of uh, order. It's not in chronological order, but it's um, when I was setting up the museum, I had to fit it in to fit the shelves. Yeah. And so it's slightly out of order, but uh, it's the best I could do under the circumstances. you've got some beautiful rare machines, like the Sam Coupe is one that I would love to have in my collection. That was in 1989. Um, a clone of the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. It was effectively it came out at a time when we had the 16-bit machines to compete. Yes, with, so. that's, that was a problem. It, that's mm. why it died a death, really, because it uh, it was too too late for the English market. A lovely looking machine, though. Just talk us through some of the other items you've got here. Then this is an interesting one up here. What's this? Yeah, this was a. Uh, MTX uh, 512 and basically what it was, it was a third party um, developer that used to make things for the Sinclair um, ZX81 and the Spectrum and the, the, uh, the quirky thing with this is if you press the two shift buttons and you type the programming but by mistake then you'd wipe the complete no, uh, memory off. Accidentally press those at the same time and That's you right. clear the memory. Just, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure if you uh, reported that, they would just tell you it was a feature. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, that's what I tell people anyway. Yeah. No, <laughs> seriously, though. Um, and then down here, you've got the Enterprise 64. Right. And the Lynx, both very interesting machines. Yeah, that was a very quirky one because what happened is most of the computers, they, they have scrolling built in, but with the Lynx computer, what used to happen is it used to fill the screen up and then it used to overwrite what was on top. So you would get yourself in the muddle unless you knew what you was doing. Yeah. Um, the Enterprise apparently came out very late before, and, and people say that was the best computer that Britain actually made. Really? Yes. That's definitely going on my list then. The BBC Micro down here was in a lot of schools in the 80s. It was certainly in mine. Do you find that that computer in particular draws a lot of people to the museum or do they get excited when they see it at the museum? Well, they do. Because yeah. a lot of visitors must be of that age now where they want to bring their own children to see their computing history. Exactly, because I mean, it was around about the time of the spectrum and you could get all different add-ons for it. You could get second processors, uh, you could get uh, um, teletext adapters, pre um, Presto adapters. Mm -hmm. it, it was, there was so much you could do and you could get a tube um, which you could connect up to all these different devices. Yeah, it has the tube port on the bottom, doesn't it? That's right. And it's that very port, I believe, that the original ARM processor was developed yeah. and tested well, on. Yeah, well, the ARM processor, as you probably know, is used in most of the, the mobile phones uh, up, well, up until now. And, I mean, it's just been bought uh, up by a Japanese company, so mm -hmm. um, I don't know what's really going to happen with Apple. Uh, Acorn nowadays. Mm -hmm. Well, they've certainly made a huge success out of their humble beginnings with the uh, the Atom, the BBC Micro, uh, and the Archimedes, which wasn't as successful, but again, it was a machine that was in a lot of our classrooms, uh, and I'm very pleased to see you've got a few examples of that around here. Moving on over here, we've got the Amstrad CPC 464. That was my first computer, oh, so that holds yeah. a special place for me. And you've got one set up around the corner, so I'll certainly have a go on that a bit later. But one that's less familiar to me is the Spectra Video SV318. Yes, it's one what of those this? that died a death very <laughs> early. It probably was only in, here for, in the company for a um, in production for about six months or so. Uh, you used to be able to get these cartridges as well as yeah. um, using um, a cassette drive with it. But uh, 
I haven't, I've got two versions of that, but uh, I've, I don't think they work, but they've got the built-in joystick as well. Yeah, so. the, it really does mimic an arcade joystick, that one with the yeah. ball top, I love that. Um, and then over here, the Auric Atmos, yeah. the CGL sword, so many rare computers, the, the E2, G2000 Color Genie. Yes. Uh, that's a lovely machine. I've, I've got an older version in that case over there. Mm -hmm. um, it's the one standing up. Yeah, um, that particular one has, a one has wood grain finished down the sides. It wouldn't look out of place next to a, an old record player. Oh, that's really right, lovely. yeah. Well, this is a research machines 480Z. And um, yeah, certainly it's not the, it may not be the biggest crowd puller. Um, it's quite an unassuming machine really, but I've, got a special affection for this machine. I met Mike and Carol and they said they ran the museum. I hadn't been here yet. Right. So I, I started asking them what machines they had. So there was obviously things like the Jupiter Ace and then the Dragon 32. And it's not my favorite machine, but it yeah. was the machine that made me interested to come here and see what they had. And I, I kind of, I must admit, I thought it would be just like the Spectrum, the Commodore 64, the Amstrad. The and then space. when they said they had a Jupiter Ace and a Dragon 32, I was like, oh, I wonder what else they've got. And obviously, as you've seen yourself, yeah. the collection is its quite eye-opening when you actually come here and see yeah. how much stuff that Mike has collected. That coming to the museum for the first time, seeing such a huge collection of computers, I think you, you do gravitate to the thing which, which has got that little bit of nostalgia, a little part of your history mm -hmm. and, and for that this is that computer but um also just seeing it in a cabinet and thinking hang on a minute that's my childhood now i'm, I'm now a museum piece yes. it kind of like <laughs> tells you a little bit about how old you maybe have got but um yeah so i've, I've still got i've still got my actual 6128 and then last year i did i did dig it out um, mm -hmm. and the the, the the common problem of course is the disk drive not working usually because the the, the elastic, the, the rubber bed doesn't perish. Yeah. So I did embark on my first attempt to do a to do a, a fix on an old computer. Ordered a replacement with elastic success. band with success. You're an expert now. Yes, yeah, it took it to <laughs> ice. It's inc anyone who ever tries this with the six hundred and thirty, it's incredibly fiddly. Just it's it's all with the tweezers, getting the angles. I was scared to remove the ribbon cable, so I didn't have as much access as some of the people yes. doing the tutorials online said that I should. But I just persevere it's it's a it's a delicate operation it's like heart surgery but mm. it was so nice seeing it booting up a disc for the first time like acorn i believe they supplied thousands of machines mm -hmm. to the education world. and can you remember what you personally did with your research machine at school were you programming or was there yes well in? the the 480 z's like this were i remember using those in the last couple of years before i left and before that i remember using 380 z's now 380 z's were great they're a big rack mounted case and the five and quarter inch drives and I believe a key, nice. um, key switch <laughs> to turn the machine on. Uh, they ran CPM, uh, disk operating system, and on the 380, these had basic in ROM actually, so you know, ready to go as soon as you switched on. With the 380Zs we had to load up basic from disk. Um, that was the extent of my computing prowess in those days, sure. right? making simple programs in basic and simple games and so on. Uh, that was my start with computers. And it's also great to um, see people enjoying them. Like, it's, as Mike said, it's quite a lot of families come. And I think a lot of families come because they think the kids are going to want to play games. Mm. But then the parents come in and they'll start to see things yeah. that they have used. Um, does, it, does it motivate you to um, learn a bit more about computer history yes. yourself so that you can answer the yeah, questions? Obviously, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, because yeah. people will point out machines and uh, yeah. I don't know everything about everything. I don't know a lot about much at all really but <laughs> yeah it's it's fascinating yeah. and um, it's really nice to be able to pass that on because people will ask questions and they'll they'll see the machine they knew and then they'll say like what's that one what's that yeah. one and then you can link things together you yeah. can say like well the spectrum was brought up by Amstrad um, so no doubt you know a lot more now than you did I when you first started I think so yes so I actually found the um on the back of one of the with the discs because the discs were two-sided you flip one over and you could you could um, put stuff on the other side of them it was the first 
database that I'd made and that's now what I do as a job. So I'd completely forgotten I'd written this and it was a simple index of my, my comic collection at the time. <laughs> it's telling me you know, I had Conan the Barbarian issue 232 on screen on the Amstrad in the high resolution font and, and there it was just still working on the disc. Excellent. Seeing it firing up and it's just it's little nice little memory. So this is a machine that you owe your career to essentially. Yeah, in yeah. a lot of ways it is. Really nice. I think another thing that forget, gets forgotten about is that research machines were invited by the BBC to tender. Hmm. Um, it uh, wasn't just Sinclair and... No, uh, no it wasn't, yeah. but research machines made the decision that they didn't think that the, the, the spec that the you know, BBC wanted a really high spec, obviously, um, as we saw. Uh, and research machines just didn't think they could do it on the budget, so they pulled out. So Mike, this, when you see this, this is a real wow moment in the museum, isn't it? This ultimate shop front, as I keep referring to it as. Yeah, is that the look that you were going for? Yeah, I like, I, I like to get it back to what I, I sort of remember when I was um, in my 20s uh -huh. in the 1980s. So you've got some really rare examples like the Commodore SX64, which is really collectible. Yes, a little portable machine, which... Uh, Use for um, five and a quarter inch discs. And in contrast, you've got the Osborne portable here, which you've got on the sign there. It says the first successful portable computer. Um, uh, nice looking machine. Yes, it, well, it's, it's more of a luggageable computer. Mm -hmm. um, but as you say, it weighs nearly 25 pounds. And uh, if you had two of them, which I've got a few more at home, you can use, use them to do weightlifting. <laughs> do your farmer's walks with a couple yes. of Osborne portables. Um, now, this is a really interesting one over here, the ITT Apple clone, uh, yes. sometimes called the Silver Apple. And this was a license clone because Apple did sometimes experiment in licensing out their technology. That's they? right. It's actually uh, uh, Apple II Euro Plus in a silver case. You can tell by the shape of it. Can yeah, it's exactly. Identical, the but they've gone for more of a, a TRS-80 style silver finish to it. Very nice indeed. And down um, here we've got the K Pro 4. Tell us about that. What do you know about I that one? I don't know too much about it actually. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was made in about 1984 and it was about 64 kilobytes of memory. Um, it was donated. It's got a very small screen, very much like the um, Osborne uh, computer. And it's got um, two um, five and a quarter inch discs which um, I've got all the bits and pieces, but I haven't actually used it yet. Mm. Well, I'll look that one up and I'll put some information on the screen because that looks like a really interesting machine. It looks like a serious bit of kit just from the, the weight of it alone, 15 kilograms it is, the machine. It, yeah, it's, it is heavy. When I was trying to put it in the case, it is very um, heavy. Um, if I have to bend down, then you know, I can fill it on my back. <laughs> and then along the back, you've got a lot of boxes for the systems. Is it important to you when you're collecting these machines to have the box and to have it If I can, box? because I, I love the graphics on the boxes. Mm -hmm. um, and I know some of them are a little bit uh, scratched and um, damaged, but i just like to show, especially youngsters, what they were like where, in my day when I was collecting. Yeah. It's not just the rare machines that you've, you've got in here. I mean, it's lovely to see the rare machines, but just as importantly, things like the Tulip PC, uh, you say on the sign there, it's a clone of the IBM XT PC in the Netherlands. No doubt there would have been lots of those about. Oh, that would be yeah, very common I mean, to Dutch people. But it's so important to be able to still see those because I think people consider them to be disposable um, even now. They mm. just go into landfill and then you, you lose that connection physical connection with history don't you yeah i've collect, tried to collect as many as i can mm -hmm. try to save them because uh, as you say they would go to landfill obviously i'm restricted again to the size of the museum yeah. which we uh, um, we haven't been able to put everything out and it, i'd need uh, something about six or eight thousand square feet but then you've got the problem 
of the rates on the building, yes. which is uh, be beyond our means. Yeah. So, um, do you have any golden rules when it comes to buying and collecting machines for yourself? So, for example, do you buy duplicates of machines that you've already got? Um, I, don't, I don't buy a lot now, mm -hmm. mainly because being pensioners, the wife and myself is approaching our 70s, and we feel that we've got enough to keep us going, and also um, we can manage with what volunteers that we've got at the moment. Obviously, uh, there are times when we're on our own, but it, um, fortunately, with the volunteers we've got, they try and jump in when they can yeah. to help us out. Well, I hope you enjoyed the retro road trip to the Micro Museum here in Ramsgate. Thank you to Mike. Thank you. Thank you to, uh, we've got Dave, Jamie and Nick, the volunteers for spending time with us today. Mike, how can people come and enjoy the, the museum? Well, first of all, they can come and visit Ramsgate. We're at number 11, Churchill, and we're also at number five to seven, Churchill, which is the games gallery uh, where they can play oodles of games. Excellent. And you have special events throughout the year, don't you? We have had special events. Um, we've got an event coming up in the next few weeks, which is the Jamie's brainchild. Right, no, and that's it's going to be an exhibition of analog synthesizer technology and electronic music. There you go, classic synthesizers, courtesy of Jamie. So it's not just computers, there's so much more to see here. And my wife does an electronic newsletter, and if you bring a, a copy of that, which you download on your, on your printer, you can get a pound off. There you go, a pound off with the electronic wow. newsletter. What do we do? Go to the website and sign up to get that sign newsletter. Sign up and you can get to know what the events are and what's actually happening in the museum and the games gallery. There you go, the address for the website should be appearing down here. Everyone point down to the bottom, please. Here is the website for the Micro Museum. Come and visit, come and see Mike and the volunteers here at the museum. Thank you for watching the road trip today. I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time. Bye bye. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.